Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Ariel Tan from the Malaysia Program at RSIS. Welcome to this webinar on the Malaysian GE, Players, Issues, and Possible Outcomes. This GE is taking place in uncharted waters with several new conditions. We have three main coalitions in Peninsular Malaysia and four in East Malaysia. Only three of the 13 states are holding their state elections this time. Around 6 million more new and young voters have been added to the electoral roll, a 40% increase from the last GE. And with few clues on their disposition, and tendency to vote. Heavy rain and floods are predicted for some areas. All this will influence voter turnout. None of the main coalitions would easily obtain a single, a simple majority in parliament. This expands the possibilities of new coalitions, agenda, and prime minister candidates. Alternatively, after the great shuffle, we may just end up with a similar government pre and post CE. All this may be quite confusing for voters and researchers alike. We are thus honored to have with us two seasoned scholars and to sort this out for us. You would have seen their bios briefly. Dr. Meredith Weiss is visiting senior fellow at RSIS and professor of political science at the State University of New York at Albany. He has published widely on social mobilization and civil society, politics and governance in Southeast Asia. Ben Sufian is Programs Director and Co-Founder of Medeca Center. Through public opinion surveys and analyses on politics and public policy, Ben and the Center have greatly contributed to the quality of public debate and participation in the Malaysian political process. They will cover the historical, and social economic context of this election, party support, platforms, candidate selection, and specific leaders. Also, demography and voter sentiment and choice. Our speakers will each make their presentation. We will have a round table discussion followed by a Q&A. My colleague, Naval, Associate Research Fellow, will come online to convey questions from the audience. Please send in your questions using the Q&A function. This event is recorded and may be made publicly available later. Now, Dr. Weiss, please. Thanks, Ariel. I will share my screen. It's loading. All right, so um, thanks everyone. Um, so this, uh, this election, as Ariel has said, is really a quite unusual one for Malaysia. Um, hang on. All right. So we know that the political history for Malaysia is quite messy. That there have been a failed transition in administration collapsed in 22 months. There were some reforms to the political system, the what's termed a competitive electoral authoritarian system. Some of those reforms were rolled back, for instance, to civil liberties, some were not. Um, there were some efforts really to change issues related to anti-corruption, to electoral procedures, to parliamentary processes. An anti-hopping law did pass under the second administration that followed Pakatans, and there was the expansion of the franchise, and we'll come back to that. But who will operate in coalition with whom, or who will really cooperate um, beyond just divvying up seats in different forms of electoral alliances remains unclear and will probably remain unclear until some point uh, either soon or a little bit longer after the election. Um, we did not see platforms from the different coalitions until fairly late. Um, and that's despite the fact that Perikata Nacional has been in power now for about two and a half years, even if subordinated to UMNO for the past year, um, and that uh, the BN had released its budget shortly before Parliament was dissolved. As Ariel mentioned, we've already had state elections in Johor Malas, despite some efforts to make them into that role, to put them in that role for various reasons. But then also the Pakatan held states and the PAS held states, so that is Selangor, Penang, and Negros, Sembilan, and then Kedah, Kelantan, and Trangana, respectively, have opted to hold their state elections separately. So we're seeing state elections only in uh, Pahang, Perlis, and Perak. 
that means that there's less opportunity for voters to split their vote opportunistically or strategically, or they might do so in the second stage of a state election. All right. This, I think, should be familiar to most. I won't dwell on the details, but this is the status quo ante. This is what Parliament looked like going in. Um, quite messy compared with the usual, essentially, two coalition system we've gotten used to seeing with um, Saban and Sarawak, even if they're somewhat separate um, in terms of strategically aligning rather than being part of the BN proper, um, that this we haven't had quite this mix of the many different colors on the map of Parliament as we had this time. All right. Um, this time we have the odd situation in which we have electoral surfing, as it's called, which is picking the best possible date for an election, which has still yielded a time for an election that in many ways is far from ideal. So Parliament was dissolved on October 10th. Uh, the, the government then, or the caretaker government, then has 60 days with the Sultan to call the election. The budget had just been tabled the preceding Friday, as I mentioned. That was seen as a BN manifesto, but now the budget starts from scratch. Uh, Prime Minister Ismail Sabri had been equivocating and clearly supported delaying the general election, as he said openly many times, um, but was pushed by party president Zahid Hamidi and others to hold the election sooner rather than later. This is, though, awkward timing. It's definitely suboptimal. And there are three major reasons I would highlight. Ariel has already touched on these to some extent. On the one hand, the economy is hardly thriving, though it's likely perhaps to get worse. So that's not really a deal breaker in terms of electoral uh, timing. There was uh, an estimated 11.7% growth in the third quarter for Malaysia. That was following 8.9% growth in the second quarter. That sounds fantastic, but that mostly reflects just the really low base given COVID shutdowns, that this is just the initial stages of a post-COVID or still mid-COVID recovery. The fact of a near certain global recession will not help, especially given Malaysia's reliance on exports. So those are especially to China and Singapore, both of which face contractions. Um, but really, we are facing the possibility of a fair, fairly dramatic global slowdown due not just to post-COVID restructure, uh, restructuring and recovery, but also the uh, war in Ukraine and other issues that disrupt supply chains, uh, disrupt fuel costs, and so forth. There's also still for Malaysia slow employment or wage growth, and very importantly, an extraordinarily weak ringgit. It's right now, last I checked, at about 4.7 to the US dollars, which is putting Malaysia back in, at best, uh, the circumstances of, um, sorry, um, the circumstances of, um, of the, the Asian financial crisis. Hang on, I've just gotten a mention that my uh, connection is spotty, so I'll turn up my video to help. Okay, um, there's also the possibility of monsoons or floods. There have already been some heavy rains. We've been driving through some as we hit the campaign trail to observe the election. Um, some campaigns were suspended this week for flash floods in parts of Kuala Lumpur and Selangor. There are predictions of some worse weather to come, especially on the East Coast, but really it could be anywhere. And then third, I had noticed before the election, before the campaign started, that there was much more news out of Singapore than Malaysia of a surge in cases, but we're seeing more news of that now for Malaysia as well. Uh, infections rose by 16.5% in the final week of October. That's not great. Um, and there's a new vaccine-resistant XBB Omicron strand that seems to be now hitting Malaysia. This could be problematic if, um, as happened with the Sabah state election, if we find uh, super spreader events from the, from the campaign. All right. Meanwhile, the electorate itself is different and the electoral landscape is somewhat different. So the electorate has grown. That's in part because of the UNDI 18 um, uh, constitutional amendment. So that um, made 18 to 21 year olds eligible to vote and introduced automatic registration of voters. So this time around, there are over 21 million voters on the electoral rolls versus just under 15 million in 2018. Most of those new voters that have been added to the rolls are from that, um, from that amendment, although there's always some level of growth in the electorate. 1.2 million approximately of those new voters are 18 to 20. In other words, they would not previously have been eligible to vote. That said, there's less partisan loyalty among voters under the age of 30, and the rate at which they'll actually turn out is also unknown for really anyone under the age of, let's say, 24, who are first-time voters. Those who couldn't be bothered to register previously are also less likely to bother to vote. That's the same as elsewhere where voting isn't compulsory. 
Meanwhile, there's a fair amount of disillusionment after two changes of government without elections. Um, and so we might see that the over 80% turnout in the last three GEs could be potentially significantly lower this time. That said, my own impression just from observing the election thus far is that enthusiasm does seem to be ramping up. Um, then we'll get into some of these issues as well um, later on. Um, I would argue that we can't read too much into the predicted popular vote tallies, in part because they shift, as Ben will describe, but also just given the um, the issues of um, where those voters are located, that some constituencies have a high proportion of voters who live and work elsewhere. We also have the constituency delineation issues that mean that we may have 100,000 voters in one area, 30,000 voters in another constituency. And so simply looking at numbers themselves has limited, um, offers limited insight. There is expanded postal voting this time, but voters who wanted to vote by post in neighboring countries previously would have to return to Malaysia, still needed to register to do so. So um, I've yet to see data on how many have registered and certainly we won't know how many actually cast their ballots. And lastly, in terms of what confounds our reading, what might the tea leaves of what might come to pass is that instead of the steady progress toward two primary coalitions, Barisan Nacional and Pakatan Harapan, or some, some alternative to Pakatan on the peninsula, plus GPS and DRS in East Malaysia, we now has, as Ariel mentioned, really three main coalitions uh, because we have Perikatan Nacional, Barisan Nacional, as well as Pakatan Harapan on the peninsula. Quite a lot of uh, independent voters of smaller parties. We have uh, Pejuang, Mahathir's party contesting in a number of seats um, and so forth. So there's a good possibility of a hung parliament and a post-election coalition, which is not normally so much the case, or rather there's a peninsular coalition that allies with its usually BN counterpart at one point, of course, Pakatan Harapan counterpart in Sabah, um, to form the government. So we could see a much more um, confusing immediate post-election scene than we normally do in Malaysia. All right. Um, in terms of public sentiment, and Ben will say more about this later, we have a situation of general unhappiness. Again, this is not great as the government goes into an election. Uh, the red line on this chart is bad, and that's been trending upwards after a slight improvement with Najib's sent sentencing. So the main issues, as you can see, that are behind that negative sentiment that most people think that the country is going in the wrong direction are economic concerns and political instability, poor administration, which is linked with both of those. Um, those are the strongest unfavorables. Malays, and interestingly to me, the youngest voters are the least unhappy, but they too are unhappy. So in other words, a lot of dissatisfaction um, at the same time that we've seen lots of predictions that the BN will romp home in this election, the BN has been in government. So this makes it really, again, hard to predict when we see a lot of general unhappiness with the direction of the government, and then an expectation also still that people will vote for that incumbent government. Um, one of the most obvious differences between this election and all others, at least in recent memory, but probably ever in Malaysia, is just that there are so many candidates. So um, 945 who are standing, um, there are selection issues that, that increase the number of candidates in a number of parties. So we have independents or we have individuals who were dropped from one party's uh, list and therefore jumped to another party um, to stand there instead. Some of this has to do with party factionalism. So Zahid's people versus Ismail Sabri's people within UMNO or um, Anwar's people versus Rafizi's people in uh, and uh, Ka'adilan, uh, some of this just has to do with the normal turnover, but basically we have a really messy electoral scene. The most number, of, the highest number of candidates in one constituency is 10 in Batu. All right, and also we have a lot of promises. And so we're seeing these on posters, on signs and in campaign messaging. Um, what is really notable is how, how minute some of the details are. I'll talk about that more in a second. But that there's really, although these are dueling platforms, there are broad similarities across them. It's notable that most of the platforms hardly touch on what might otherwise be the most sticky issues to navigate in terms of a post-election coalition. So we see fairly little in terms of really precise statements about minority rights or Malay Muslim rights, for instance, which could differentiate these, these coalitions more than some others, other issues might. Um, and so 
So that itself um, is, is really um, a notable thing here. There are some issues on which we've seen specific campaigns focus that I haven't really seen much attention into previously, like food security. Beyond the cost of living is a broad issue. Uh, so this party durian that um, uh, that uh, Pakatan Harapan had uh, yesterday in Penang really got into these issues of food security and agribusiness. I think think some of this is really spurred by by COVID, by the realization across countries, certainly in Malaysia as well, of the necessity of making sure that each country can maintain its own food security and of the extent to which relying on um, industry may not be a sufficient um, basis for, for a country like Malaysia or it needs to be more agro industry. All campaigns are saying that the key issues are economic, so job creation, the cost of living and so forth. Um, and yet the refrain across so many candidates uh, we've met so far during the campaign is really that in light of all the party hopping, of all the reshuffling of coalitions, all of that, that candidates are hoping that the voters will vote for them rather than for the party. So you have people like, um, you know, Mas Amirati, for instance, from Perikatan, who has been in now, you know, different coalitions, um, has argued that it is her own record of service rather than the party under which she campaigns at any given time that will really determine that she can build support, that she can win the election. And so there's a lot of focus on what sort of bantuan, what sort of aid the individual as well as the party has provided, but really not to look at the party brand or the party logo, um, but rather at um, what the candidate has done and the service they'll provide. One last thing I would mention about that is that we have both Frikata Nacional, which is uh, PAS, um, Bursatu, and Grakan running under its coordinated PN logo. And then also Pakatan running not under the rocket and the moon uh, and Amana's orange banner, but rather very coordinatedly under, now that they're a registered party as Pakatan Harapan, under the Pakatan logo. For some candidates in either of those coalitions, that's a benefit. So for instance, for some Malay candidates who are running under DAP within Pakatan, it can be an advantage to be running under the Pakatan logo rather than under the DAP's rocket. But for others, it's really a disadvantage because voters are familiar with the Orangulan, with the Pas Moon, for instance, or with the rocket. And that's what they really are looking for. And there might be some confusion among voters about which of these three coalitions. One of them is Barasan Nacional. They know that one, certainly that's been consistent, but then there are these two others. So there's some concern among um, party teams and candidates that their voters might be a bit confused. They're working on that. Um, in terms of the manifestos, there are some differences in emphasis, but the broad thrust is um, on a lot of very small, minutely delineated policies that each will provide within these broad agendas of economic development, prosperity, um, and so forth. So the BN's stability and prosperity theme in their um, their Padu Manifesto, Pranjangan Amal Dan Usaha, is income support for low-income households, education support at all levels, citizenship rights for children born to Malaysian women abroad, um, ways to attract foreign direct investment, ways to address food insecurity, ways to promote uh, renewable energy generation, electro, electric vehicles, things like that. For Prikata Nacional, we have the Tarwan PN Best. There are 12 pillars with specific approaches under each, and I'm only hitting a few highlights for each of these. So they'll introduce a new Prikata Nacional to access social services. There's tar there are targeted development schemes for Orang Asli, for Felda, for the elderly, and so forth. Um, extension of 5G internet, uh, food aid, higher pay for servants, all these things. Pakatan Harapan also would address rising costs of living. They have, I think, the clearest articulation of a set of institutional reforms building on what they promised previously. Things like a fixed parliamentary term, um, absentee ballots uh, for voters, equal constituency development funds, which would continue with the MOU and the last government, a parliamentary budget office and so forth. They're promising 35% of seats for East Malaysia and that one of two deputy prime ministers would be from East Malaysia. Their anti-corruption emphases, um, but then also development of targeted industries like green industries, agro industry, like the other parties, they'll address gender inequality, reforms to healthcare, like to contract doctors, reducing tolls. So the main thing to note is that there are differences in emphases. These are not identical platforms. And yet at the same time, the broad thrust for each is really amenable to being in coalition with different possible partners. 
So we're left with a really hard to predict election. And um, ask you a question that perhaps you, you could address later. Um, this is a question on parties. Um, may we have your assessment of the state of uh, the key parties today? AMNO, DAP, PKR, PAS, Versatu, um, you know, the, the, the state of the party, the health of the coalition, and what is that public image and, and the voter perception of each party today? Um, thank you. So for now, let, let me turn to Ben. Thank you, Ben. Okay, so let me um, share my slides as well. Okay. So we ran uh, a pre-election survey just about a week before nomination day, and now we are continuing uh, with our tracking survey. And so some of the data that I'm going to present uh, will draw upon the pre-election survey, as well as the more recent data from the last few days in the tracking survey that we're running. Unfortunately, we are only doing West Malaysia in terms of tracking, in part because we think that the situation in Sabah and Sarawak is less, uh, less prone to uncertainty. And so we are focusing on this, uh, on this part, on this side of the pond. Right. Right. So, um, yeah. So to date, I mean, we have started this survey from uh, November 3rd. And I think what we can say is that the, the large number of new voters, you know, 1.8, uh, what we call genuine only 18 voters, people who are below 24 years old, and about 4.5 million people who were previously eligible, but only recently automatically registered. Uh, the turnout of these people and how they're going to choose is definitely going to affect the results, particularly in West Malaysia. As things currently stand, and as Meredith has already mentioned, the outcome seems to be a bit uncertain because these three coalitions that are contesting are almost at equal strength. They have strengths and weaknesses in certain constituencies and it makes it very hard to predict because we have constituencies that are mixed ethnicity where a small change in the number of support from one, from one, one ethnic group or one segment of the voter to one coalition could change the results for the other two. And so there is a kind of arithmetic formula that we're trying to work out that as turnout improves for one segment of the population or the numbers ebb and flow, uh, how will it affect the seats that each coalition will gain in parliament? So we have so many new voters uh, and we also have very many more uh, new candidates, 945 new candidates as well as many parties uh, that are contesting right now. But I think what really is quite clear is that with the exception of Said Sadi, the leaders of all of these coalitions and the top leaders are all Malay men in their 70s. Uh, and it makes it very hard for them to actually uh, connect with voters who are 18 and 19 years old. And so far, what we notice is that within these younger groups, not many of them, well, there's still a significant portion of them that have yet to decide one week away from election day. That's one point. The other point is that although AMNO and Barisan National has been agitating, pushing for early dissolution of parliament and have actually gained it, the campaign dynamics in terms of how campaigns are carried out, in terms of messaging, and in terms of the movement of uh, activists and party workers it is all very dissipated, particularly communications, dissipated through very localized communications. There isn't a sort of national spokesman speaking on behalf of the, the national leadership of these parties that are coming through in a strong way. And so when we look at a lot of the messaging that's coming, coming across on social media, it's actually bits and pieces that are coming out from the individual campaigns of top leaders as they try to get voters in their districts or if as they try to help there are other party contestants in other areas. So there isn't a kind of centralized communications office. In terms of overall voting motivations, you know, race and, uh, and regionalism has you know, typically been the pattern here. And so we've tried to understand uh, how much the ethnic voting patterns factor into this election. I think it's still significant, but amongst younger voters, we do detect a slightly lower uh, adherence to the old patterns, the younger voters are more, uh, place more importance on other pra practical policy issues as opposed to the standard identity uh, politics of the past. 
Uh, and no single leader, you know, is popular across the board. Uh, likewise for the parties as well. And so this, I think, makes it for a very interesting election because there is uh, no, no clear outcome as we are one week away from election day. So let me just go through the rest of the slides. Voting factors. So when we ask people about who they are going to choose, we find that there is a significant difference between uh, the different generations that Older voters tend to choose political parties. Younger voters tend to focus more on candidates, whether it is the prime minister candidate or a general leadership, the leadership for the country at 24 versus 13% overall. They're less fixated on who's going to become PM, but rather who's going to set the tone for the country. That's one. But there are some differences among young people as well. Among the younger Chinese voters, 20 year olds and below, political party still means uh, fairly significantly for them compared to the other age groups. And I think this actually speaks to the long-standing support that Chinese voters in Malaysia have for PH, uh, urban voters, and also the issues that they have continuously faced, uh, I think have prompted them to make this uh, coalition uh, their choice uh, going into the election, even if not all of them are happy uh, with Pakatan Harapan. So we move on further into motivations for party choice. Now, this is a fairly crowded uh, slide. So what we've tried to do in our surveys is to find out between three key concepts, you know, identity politics marked there as race, uh, about the economy or governance or corruption as the issues that are frequently championed by the opposition, which one figures more in terms of what voters uh, feel will influence them in choosing the candidates or the parties in this particular election. So we find that the economic issues is first and foremost. When we compare race versus the economy, whether someone felt that um, they are going to choose for a party that's going to protect the interests of their ethnic or regional community versus a party that can fix the economy, 75% of voters uh, overall choose a party that can address the economy. And this is the case with Malay voters as well. But you can see a slight difference there. 24% of all Malay voters still take race as an important marker in choosing a party. But there is a significant difference between the different age groups. Voters 18 to 30 years old are less likely to choose race or the ethnic interest over the economic problems that they are facing, as opposed to voters who are 50 years old and above, that's still a significant number, 27% place race as more important than uh, even the economy. When we look at the other topics, the respondents in our surveys are more split between the economy and fighting corruption. We have a nearly even split, 50-50, between corruption and ethnic politics. The uh, split is again, uh, nearly half. So what it means is that for parties like Pakatan Harapan, if they seek to try and expand their base of support, particularly between with ethnic Malays, uh, they probably need to uh, temper it with more stories and more uh, discussions about the economy, as opposed to just relying on governance. Uh, because when compared to identity politics, the governance is only effective on about half of those voters. In terms of overall perceptions of this voter, you know, coming from our pre-election survey, so this is before nomination, the graph on the left-hand side, what we do notice is that there is a very clear pattern of preference for parties that voters want to manage the country after the election. You know, non-Malay voters have shown significant tendency to uh, choose PH, but Malay voters are split three ways, but only so in a sense that Barisan National, despite being in power for the last 60 over years, you know, can only capture the confidence of about 37% of the Malay electorate. Only 12% is going for Pakatan Harapan, and at that point in time, 14% of Perikatan National. Quite a large number of voters, about one third, have not yet made up their minds at that point in time, didn't want, you know, don't know, can't choose. And many of them consisted of two specific segments. Uh, one notably would be younger people, younger voters, and number two, women, women in the working age category. 
Uh, so we go further in terms of, you know, party that voters wish to lead. And so I think here, you know, we can see uh, the migration or change in the number from pre-election before dissolution and then after parliament was dissolved. Here, the Pakatan Harapan numbers for among Malay respondents have not changed. It still stays at about 14-15%. But the Pakatan national number has taken a big jump from 14% before dissolution to, sorry, from 14% before nomination day to 35% on November 8th, just early this week. So we, we are tracking this on a day by day basis. And the Barisan national number has slipped a little to 28%. So this speaks of a very dynamic campaign and that the kind of leadership and the messaging that this party is put across to voters suggests that I think voters are making up their minds and that there are some clear indicators of people who are attracting support and people who are repelling support from the party. And then if you go to the next uh, part of the slide on the right-hand side choice, given how candidates and leadership figure most importantly amongst younger people, as well as people who are uh, choosing in this election, we can notice that among Malay voters, at least up to 8th of November, Mohidin Yassin, has captured about 36% of the voters' preference uh, for P Prime Minister, as opposed to 15% of Anwar Ibrahim and 25% for Ismail Sabri. So, you know, this speaks of a change in terms of dynamics. Uh, so, despite the fact that many people, you know, don't give high ratings to leaders, there is a clear preference, a strengthening of preference for Muhyiddin among Malay voters. Uh, but yet, Anwar Ibrahim still captures the hearts and minds of a majority of non-Muslim, uh, non-Malay voters. So I have here, you know, the, the kind of running average of the uh, various leaders that are, you know, competing in this contest. We have Ismail Sabri, you know, his numbers, overall approval rating or popularity rating is about 45%. Uh, Muhyiddin Yassin about 45% as well. Zahid Hamidi at 10 Hadi Awang higher than Zahid at 32%, but high negatives. Mahathir Muhammad at 26. Anwar Ibrahim overall 35. And Muhammad Hassan, who's Amnu Deputy President at 28%, and a large degree of people who don't know him. If you look at these numbers across the different ethnic groups, and this is the chart displaying Malay patterns, you can see a very distinct uh, advantage that Muhyiddin has over some of the other leaders. Muhyiddin's approval rating among Malay voters alone is 67%, higher than Ismail Sabri at 61%. Ismail Sabri's number at 61% shows a slight rise after AMNO on Monday night, AMNO President Zahid again uh, confirmed that uh, you know, Ismail Sabri will become Prime Minister again uh, should Barisan National win the election. Other leaders have far lower numbers and Pakatan Harapan President Anwar Ibrahim stands at 24% among Malay voters and Zahid is only 13% amongst Malay voters. So what it means is that even among AMNO supporters, there are significant numbers of them that don't approve of Zahid Hamidi. Um, overall turnout, uh, I think is an important factor in this election, partly because as we head into this election, there's a concern that voters are not going to come back to vote, particularly voters uh, voting in urban areas, the minorities and younger voters. But what we've noticed in the last few days is that turnout interest has improved, uh, that amongst non-Malay voters, there's a steady, you know, uh, sort of increase in the intention to come out to vote. So I have here in this chart, uh, two lines. And in case what you're wondering is that the first line is what these voters say that they're going to vote. These are people who gave a score of 10 on the likelihood of them coming out to vote. And then the red line indicates an adjusted number based on past experience. There's a lot of self-affirming bias here. Um, and what we've done is that we've uh, adjusted the number downwards to reflect the lessons learned from previous surveys during elections in the last two years. So overall turnout estimated perhaps 75, 76% up to the 7th of November. So I think the figures will continue to change over the coming days, but Overall, turnout overall is lower than the 80% that we are used to in the last couple of elections, but still at 70% with an expanded voter base is probably not bad.
voting inclination. Uh, so this is an overall voter choice for the different uh, you know, coalitions that's vying for power, vying for control in Peninsula Malaysia. We've not included the Sabah Sarawak parties here. You can see that you know, Pakatan Harapan's base is fairly stable up to the 8th of November. So this represents uh, voters who overtly say they're choosing you know, one of these uh, coalitions. Uh, Barisan National number shows a shrinkage uh, from 24 to 17. And uh, Prikatan National's number has increased slightly from 13 to 17. And then there's an increase in the number of people who refuse to disclose or people who say they have no preference. From our past experience, we think that ultimately all of this, among the people who either say they're unsure or have no preference, or refuse to respond, uh, we think that about half of them already know which party they're going to choose. But because of the nature of political culture in Malaysia, many people hesitate to disclose it to surveyors and, and so on. Uh, but we think that half of this number have already decided. But the many of those who are undecided are younger people uh, who are voting for the first time and the automatically registered voters. So this is the breakdown of the same slide from uh, the 8th of November. So what I have here is a, a kind of running tally from May this year all the way up to 8th of November. But what I'm showing here is the breakdown of the overt responses of voters to political parties that are contesting in West Malaysia uh, up to the 8th of November. And we can see that uh, amongst uh, the public uh, the younger voters, you know, not as many of them are saying unsure or refused. Many of them have certain clarity. There is a clear distinct advantage at 35% for Prikatan National amongst those who are 20 year old and below. Uh, and these are largely Malay voters. Uh, so there is lack of, uh, they're not masking their answers here. And Barisan National is number two at 22%. Pakatan, uh, sorry, Barisan National is number three at 16%. Pakatan Harapan at 22, uh, and about 14% and 9%, so about 25% they're about saying they're unsure. But many of them are still young people. And then of the people who are 21 and above, we have a far higher number of people who say they're not sure. We think that they, they probably know who they want to vote for, but not telling us. So I think to sum up, the current state of play right now uh, amongst the three principal coalitions running in Peninsula Malaysia is that Barisan National, they, you know, up to the early part of this week, they seem to be losing some momentum, particularly amongst the Malay voters. Uh, but I think uh, the velocity of the decline, the rate in which the support is declining, that has slowed down and perhaps that has stopped and begin to reverse. When we uh, speak to activists and, you know, party leaders that are, uh, organizing, overseeing their campaigns, they admitted that the campaign activities had been sluggish from nomination day onwards, and they had spent the first few days of the campaign trying to address the problem of uh, internal, pro internal problems. You know, as was noted before, a large number of candidates, senior, senior party figures had been dropped. Uh, we know of at least 10 big names, like Shahidan Kasim, Anwar Musa, and a few others that have been dropped from their seats. So uh, there's some issues in terms of how these people, uh, how these senior leaders who are also division leaders uh, is conducting themselves and whether or not they can salvage the campaigns in those places. So in some places it's working well, in some places such as in Perlis it's not doing so well. Um, so this internal strife and sabotage I think is critical because what we note is that not only some of the big names uh, have been dropped, that they also less smaller problems, but could have a significant impact in a very tight race because there are many areas where AMNO lost in 2018 and the division chiefs have been vying to uh, become selected as candidates and have been working the ground for the last three years or so, but in the end, uh, they have not been selected as a candidate. And so you do have some people who are holding back from supporting the candidates that are actually uh, contesting. So the division the party machinery in some of these locations have not gone out full force. And the other factor that's playing into this is that right after this general election is concluded, within the next uh, maybe three, four months, you know, AMNO is going to have its uh, party elections. 
And so there is a probability that some leaders, some groups are holding back the resources that they have because they want to use it to fight the party election that's probably going to take place sometime in February or March next year. So, so that's, I think, the internal issue. The external factors that's coming to play for Barisan National is the uh, general dissatisfaction or dislike for the party president. And we think this is, a, I think, a big drag in terms of the party numbers. And I think quietly as well as overtly, openly, like Skyri Jamaluddin, some candidates have actively been trying to distance themselves from the party president. And this, I think, you know, rubs very poorly in terms of Barisan National's uh, prospects in this election. But still, uh, it's the strongest party. They have a fairly large machinery that's still operational in many parts of the country. So, and there's still eight days to election. Things can still be turned around. Pakatan Harapan, you know, overall still has the largest share of safe seats, principally uh, the urban seats held by DAP and uh, PKR. Uh, but I think we think that Pakatan Harapan has a more uphill challenge to expand because of the lack of support or traction with Malay voters. In the early parts of the campaign, uh, there seemed to be an improvement in the numbers. Hence, we hear uh, party leaders saying that, oh, they can win 100 seats, 80 plus seats and so on. Uh, but Pakatan Harapan's advance or seat acquisition is predicated on two things. Number one, it has to expand its Malay support. The closer it gets beyond 20%, the better it gets for them. Number two, they really have to drive turnout for non-Malay voters. If they can push non-Malay voter Indian and Chinese turnout higher than 72 to 74%, then any shortfall in Malay votes is not going to cost them too much. So if they can get 17, 18% Malay support, but 75% non-Malay turnout, then their numbers won't be so bad. And they will still have the biggest seats in the house after elections are concluded. The wild card here is Prikatan National. What we notice is that Prikatan National, you know, had a very iffy, choppy kind of pathway to the uh, prior to dissolution, in part because past Islamic Party had been talking to Amno right to the end with uh, some members of the party, some leaders promoting this idea of Muafakat National. That has ended. And some of the past leaders that were promoting this agenda has been actually booted out from the party and are now standing as AMNO candidates in the state of Trangganu as well as Kelantan. So in many ways, the party has cleaned itself out of people who have been advocating to work more closely with Barisan National. Uh, and at the same time, uh, we notice that in this particular campaign, past leaders have been very muted in terms of making national or large or main, mainstream public statements. They have basically been quietly working the ground. Most of these communications that are coming out is coming out from Prikatan national leader, uh, former PM Mohidin Yassin. Uh, and it has, we see, at least from the survey, that it's been taking additional Malay swing votes away from Barisan National, away from PH. Uh, and if this trend persists, uh, then you know it could potentially eclipse AMNO and Barisan National in the overall seat share in Parliament, especially in West Malaysia. We also have to bear in mind that Prikata National also has its allies in GRS, Gerakan Rakyat Sabah, which has an electoral pact with Barisan National over there, splitting the 26 seats in uh, Sabah among themselves. So there is a strong likelihood that Prikata National can also win some seats in Sabah as well. So add that to what they win in Peninsula Malaysia, they might end up with a fairly reasonably sized share. And the other thing is this, for Prikata National to gain more share and eclipse uh, Barisan National AMNO, they need to try and get more than 50% of the Malay votes. We think right now they're not there yet, but we have a week to go uh, and, and things could go either way. At the end of it all, if Prikatan National does do well in terms of capturing about one half of the Malay vote share, uh, the real winner, we think, in our view, will be PAS because PAS is contesting only 62 seats, but it's, set, it's contesting in seats that are very deeply Malay in terms of voter composition. So we think that PAS probably would sweep nearly all of the seats that are 80% Malay majority or higher, and some of the 70% Malay majority or higher especially in the north, in the east coast, 
there is also a possibility that they will make inroads into Pahang and certain parts of Perak as well. So we have to watch this. And that uh, if PAS does end up getting a bigger share of the Malay votes and, and end up with a bigger share of seats compared to AMNO, then I think that marks uh, the end of one era and the beginning of another. Right, so possible election outcomes, uh, you know, as how we see things now, I think we have one scenario with uncharted waters where we might have a totally new coalition government where, you know, Barisan doesn't have enough Malay support and most of those Malay support goes to PN, but none of this coalition will have an outright majority. And so PN, PN has the bigger share of Malay votes and Malay seats, and that they would then be able to try and cobble together a coalition with Barisan National again, GPS, or even some of the Sabah party. And uh, similar to the present setup with uh, Mohidin Yassin back as a prime minister, that's one possibility. Uh, but, uh, a situation where PAS will have a bigger share in the cabinet. Number two is, you know, Pakatan Harapan has the bigger share of seats and then they try to form a coalition with either Barisan National or GPS to form a simple majority. That's also uh, a possibility. So these are two possible scenarios. Uh, the third scenario, which is still uh, possible, but uh, I would say given a less uh, lower, a lower probability, uh, is like, you know, Parik Perikatan Nationals uh, onslaught in trying to get Malay votes away from BN Fortis. Malay votes go back to Barisan National and then Barisan National has enough of a plurality and number of seats in Peninsula Malaysia and then joins with uh, GPS and perhaps even PASS. So that's, I think, three possible election outcomes that we're looking at right now. But I'm sure there are other permutations out there. But when we ask voters in terms of who they prefer, uh, you know, this response is heavily weighted in the favor of Malay voters because they make up a big share of the electorate. So the BN plus PN combination has uh, the highest uh, preference at 30% compared to a BN plus PH or PH plus PN combination. So, you know, so we can see that there's no clear preference for any uh, coalitions that could be formed. Uh, and that ends my presentation right now, and I pass it back to Arya. Could we have Meredith uh, come on to enlighten us? Thank you. Sure. Um, so I, 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 so this uh, Arya's question was about the state of the different parties and, and how coherent they are and so forth. Ben's touched on some of that. I'll touch on some uh, overlapping or, or slightly different angles. I think each side and their sympathetic media have um, an incentive to play up the messiness in their competition. And yet it is not just propaganda that there are divisions. And we see that with the efforts, for instance, to sideline uh, individuals from rival factions when they, within each party um, and just what we know about how there have been factional splits within the parties. That said, said, the parties and coalitions are pulling together, as anyone would have expected as the election ramps up. All have an incentive to play nice together and to present a united front when they're running under the same, the same logo, the same party label as a coalition. So as, as Ben noted, I, I agree. I think Prikata Nacional is, is perhaps the most surprising in that regard, that they've really formed quite recently in their final um, composition. Um, but they've really solidified their makeup now, and at least on the West Coast, I have to say, I've yet to travel to the East Coast that's coming up. And so it might be that PAS, for instance, really presents itself more visibly differently um, there than it than is the case um, on the, the West Coast, and that, that would be in line with past experience. But so far, I'm seeing a very disciplined presentation as Perikata Nacional with massive flag coverage. I mean, just really outdoing even BN, which is amazing. Um, given the number of flags. Um, in terms of BN, in talking with different candidates or in just observing campaign messaging, there does seem to be some equivocation, unsurprisingly, around party leadership. So most seem to be deferring or sidestepping the question of Zahid, mentioning that, oh yes, you know, that that memorandum that all were supposedly asked to sign, saying that they would back Zahid's decision on the cabinet, that that's, that's fake news. I, I don't know if it is or not, just because I don't, I'm not privy to the some of the internal party machinations, but the BN has reiterated its support of Ismail Sabri as PM. That said, we don't see 
you know, in the past, if you if you think back to the last two elections, we saw Najib, especially GE13, so prominently in party messaging. Some of that has to do with just the timing of getting flags and banners and um, posts is printed up that you start with the party president and then you move on from there with the candidates once the the nominations have happened but it's not reducible just to that um and so that really reflects this very unusual situation bn is in in which the party president and the incumbent prime minister are not one and the same and there may be a post-election power struggle for the pm if BN does get to head the government. And so we most recently heard Kyrie Jamaluddin mentioning that, by the way, he would also be happy to be PM um, in case anyone had forgotten. Um, in terms of Pakatan Harapan, again, they've been quite disciplined in pulling together under the PH logo. And there is, I think, good cooperation. There have been some complaints about um, especially non-Chinese uh, PH candidates taking Chinese voters for granted, focusing more on trying to build up the Malay vote and assuming that the Chinese and Indian vote will simply come along and don't need to be catered to or wooed in the same way. That said, as Ben's data show, that may be correct. There just aren't the, the same range of choices for non-Malay voters as there are for Malay voters. Um, as especially where there are both um, state and federal candidates on the ballot now, for instance, in Perak, there does seem to be some divvying up of responsibility for each party's candidate in a given area, such that you know, Adilan candidates are catered to mostly by a Adilan team, DAP candidates by a DAP team and so forth. But that may also reflect the fact that Versatu and PAS machinery tend to be stronger in differing rather than overlapping areas, whereas we have some urban areas where both Adilan and DAP are strong, you know, have the basis. So it might just be, you know, the question of, of really needing to rely on each other's machinery, which was really part of the impetus for forming uh, Prikata Nacional in the first place. Um, and again, that this is different where we have only the federal election, which is most of Malaysia this time around, where within any given constituency, there's only one candidate and that's the coalition's candidate. Um, in terms of Errol's question about whether that's because they're positioning for a split, I, I don't think so. I haven't seen any indication of that. And there seems no obvious reason to expect that. Um, it, it might be, um, you know, it, that might be part of the, internal dialogue that's going on or within parties, but I, I think it's more just about where the machinery happens to be and how many candidates are contesting. Some may also be a bit exhausted. We've heard that, you know, it's easier to have simultaneous state and federal elections that where you've had a fairly recent state election, there's been a lot of money spent. There's been a fair amount of exhaustion of, of the volunteers who are needed to play a role. And so I think it's more about that balancing out. Um, we um, one thing that's worth bearing in mind in terms of looking at the relative strength and cohesiveness of parties and coalitions. I do think that there is a greater emphasis on the personal vote now, especially among those, some of whom are quite prominent in their parties and coalitions, who had been hoppers, who had shifted parties where they contested last time, uh, perhaps as Pakatan Harapan Versatu, and then were part of Versatu in, a, in Prikata Nacional as a government, and now are Prikata Nacional not collaborating with BN. You know, it's a hard it's a hard, hard ground to navigate in terms of where they stand in terms of their party. And they may not want to remind voters of that too much, even if the party itself, especially in the case of Purikatan, it does seem to be really quite effectively coming together. We know from experience elsewhere that where we have a stronger personal than party vote, that situation lends itself more to things like money politics, to a more transactional politics. That does doesn't mean that there'll suddenly be a surge in vote buying in Malaysia any more than there has been in the past, which is to say there's some, but it's less in Malaysia than in neighboring countries. But it does mean that we may see more of an emphasis on credit claiming at the individual candidate level on um, based on their personal service, their personal outreach, their working the ground as an individual rather than on what the party has delivered. And that also applies or is exacerbated by the difficulty for voters or for parties themselves of really identifying who to credit for what. So we had 22 months under Pakatan Harapan uh, and some of the, for instance, COVID payouts were really under that government, the initial payments, the initial strategy. We had things like the anti-hopping initiative, which a number of, of parties and teams have mentioned, they are really playing up to their voters. That you don't have to worry now if you vote Prikatan, there will be no more hopping. It won't happen. Or if you vote Pakatan, our party will not split again because no more hopping. Um, but that was part of the MOU between Pakatan and you know the BNPN alliance. Um, and so to whom should credit flow for that reform? 
In addition, PN and BN candidates are both competing most fiercely in many cases against their fellow incumbents. They're, you know, they were part of the government together. So it's hard to knock the failings of the past administration to encourage retrospective voting against what they're, what's been in, in the recent past. If you are part of that government in the, the most recent administration. Um, so that makes for just a more complex party branding in terms of not just the logo, but really what the party can claim to have done. It's easier than to focus, especially where there are incumbents on what that incumbent has done. And lastly, I would say um, just in this train that the extremely strong emphasis on social media, TikTok, Facebook, WhatsApp, um, all Instagram, all the platforms, all the things, all of that tends to encourage also a very personal approach because of the storytelling focus, the inability to get really complex messaging across, um, the difficulty then of connecting, for instance, there have been some very effective viral messages of Muhyiddin, for instance, you know, 4 p.m., but that's likely still to be most effective in his own constituency or at least state versus um, connecting you know, a different candidate with that imaging, especially when it's a new, less known coalition. I don't think all voters are that familiar with Prikatan and, and what its logo is and that, oh, Muhyiddin would, would be necessarily their PM. There might be PAS voters in addition who hope that, yeah, maybe it's Muhyiddin, but perhaps if PAS is really the, the reason that, for, that Prikatan surges, maybe it's somebody from PAS instead. So there's there's that issue. And then finally, Ariel's question about, you know, what could be a last minute surge or something that will really tip the balance. I wouldn't expect any one signal. Um, I will say that the LRT breakdown in Kuala Lumpur now is highly unfortunate for the incumbents, um, especially BN, but potentially also PN. Um, it's not as though um, Pakatan, were it in government, could have stopped a mechanical or safety failure, I think it was, on some of it. But as I understand it, some of the trains weren't showing up on the you know, the, the monitoring um, sites. Um, but at the same time, the party that, that is in power or that is caretaking the government at the moment that happens, that that's unfortunate for them. So if that's not solved soon, that could be one of those things, but probably just in the Klein Valley. Thank you. Thank you so much, Meredith. And now, Ben. Yeah. Uh... <clears throat> So responding to a few of the, the questions you pose, and I think there are also questions on the Q&A box. Uh, I'll go ahead and try to address that as well. Uh, I think number one, with respect to the, you know, the lesser importance attached to ethnic or identity politics amongst some of the younger Malay voters, you know, it's a, I think it's largely due to, uh, you know, what you said that many of the younger people are uh, not as, uh, I mean, they, they have actually, you know, grown up in a situation where the Malay role in politics, government and business has become more dominant. So it's less of a fear uh, that they have compared to previous generations. Um, so I think that's, that's fairly, fairly clear in terms of, uh, you know, what we are seeing. At the same time, uh, even amongst them, the younger, uh, Malay voters are living in a time period where they do not enjoy uh, a lot of the privileges or benefits that previous generations did. You know, earlier generations like mine enjoyed scholarships, preferential places in uh, public sector employment, uh, more generous, uh, you know, things like share allocations, you know, equity allocations in companies and all that. Um, you know, and so now things are more competitive compared to where things are. So there's less, uh, less in store for them and that the so-called privileges or Malay privileges isn't as evident as it was before. That's, that's, I think, the main point. So I think what's left is pretty much the momentum of old sentiments that the Malays need to be in power and need to set the policies and tone for the country. That's, I think, what's uh, driving that. But for the vast majority, their lives and their future ahead is pretty much no different than that of the minority voters in the country. Uh, so confronted with this, you know, with this backdrop, big backdrop, you have two large coalitions that's uh, offering themselves to lead the Malay community. You have Barisan National and you have Prikatan National. And Prikatan National, uh, I know I have uh, Malay friends who disagree with me on this, you know, Prikata National, specifically PAS, continues to maintain an image that they are cleaner than BN. 
that may not be the case, you know, in, in all respects, but that's the impression that people have. And people are looking beyond the track records of them managing their states uh, and looking at, you know, the religious credentials of their leaders. And here, I think, you know, it dovetails with the rising uh, adherence uh, and also appreciation of Islam in their lives, uh, particularly amongst younger people. So that goes together. The Islamization process that started in the early 80s has continued. Uh, and that has, I think, colored the, you know, the, the viewpoint, the mindset of many Malaysian uh, Malay voters. And that, I think, lends some weight for them to consider PAS. Uh, so, so it's not heresy to vote it for PAS. Uh, I think for the younger people. And that's why I think we can see a surge uh, on the part of young voters over to Prikatan at this point in time. Things could still shift in the coming days. In terms of coalition partners, uh, you know, as things stand, you know, GPS certainly would be more open to work with Barisan National because you know, GPS itself was Barisan National Sarawak. But I think you know, things have changed. And GPS probably, uh, just, I'm just thinking out loud here, GPS probably would want to work with a weaker West Malaysian partner so that they have more leverage in their quest for greater autonomy for their states. And likewise, the coalition, the potential coalition partners in Sabah as well. So in this case, you know, a weaker Barisan National or a Perikatan National that has a large share of seats may be a more preferred partner as compared to Pakatan Harapan simply because the parties from the East will have greater say over policy and the changes that they want to enact in the coming four or five years. Uh, but having said that, I think we also cannot uh, deny the fact that at an individual level, uh, PH leaders like Anwar Ibrahim and many of the Barisan national leaders, you know, they know each other from the past. Uh, they have been part of the same faction in AMNO before. So I wouldn't put it past uh, the possibility that you know BN and Pakatan Harapan could potentially work something out as well. Uh, then you would have the power centered in Peninsular Malaysia, and you have a more stronger Putrajaya that can try to fend off demand for greater autonomy and devolution from the east. So that those are, I think, two possible uh, scenarios moving out. I think the clear sticky point here is whether or not. Uh, you know, Pakatan Harapan supporters and politicians and Barisan National supporters and politicians are able to look beyond and work with uh, PH, especially the DAP. Uh, and, and, and I think here, I think the DAP has done their part, you know, the leadership of DAP has changed. Uh, and I think it's presenting a more amenable uh, face to the Malay uh, population out there. I think the last point I want to add before I go to the other questions is uh, I think over the next few days, what we are seeing is you know basically the remainder of the campaign is pretty much tactical. There is uh, no strategic moves that we think can be done. The manifestos has already been added out, but it doesn't get a lot of treatment, partly because the campaigns are so localized uh, and there isn't a kind of national level messaging that's coming out in a very strong way. Even the online campaign that's coming out, we are tracking that as well. Uh, it still is picking up information coming from individual leaders uh, and that gets repeated on social media platforms and the bubbles that form around it. Um, so some numbers go up, some numbers go down. Uh, and so that's going to have a very tactical uh, effect unless something major happens. I think two, two or three things uh, uh, to be uh, what we are looking out for. Number one, would be the weather, weather, flooding, flooding problems. Uh, already there's flooding in Selangor, inshallah. Uh, and I can see that right immediately within a couple of hours, uh, opposition uh, leaders and activists are putting up uh, things on TikTok and uh, Twitter about how previously, just a few weeks ago, AMNO leaders had said that, no, 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 there's not going to be floods, so we'll be ready or prepared for it, you know? And so, and all these candidates are racing to be with the flood victims, you know, wait in the mud. Uh, so we have that. So if this becomes more prevalent over the weekend and a few days beyond, this could take a different tone in the election, especially amongst the swing voters. That's number one. Number two would be the issue of leadership again. I think there's a, a lot of emphasis on the part of opposition against uh, Zahid Hamidi because they, they know that Zahid's number is quite low. 
And, uh, and we can also see that Zahid Hamidi's numbers actually improved a little bit after he, he reiterated that Ismail Sabri will become prime minister and not him. So, so that I think is still going to be the key uh, moving forward. And also on the part of PH, you know, what they are trying to do in order to capture Malay support. In the last few days, the messaging that has come out from PH has somehow been skewed towards you know, how some of leaders uh, reported their assets and, and stuff like that, and not about their party programs and their promises to the public. So those are some things. But I think the party to watch is actually PAS and Prikata National because uh, of how much the surge or the swing in Malay voters has come to them. And then to the other extent, it's on Pakatan Harapan, whether or not they are able to grow their seat share from what they currently have and perhaps gain another 3 to 5% more. Pakatan Harapan just need a marginal shift in Malay support to actually perform relatively well. Uh, and then, you know, then it opens up the door for post-election bargaining. Uh, let me look at some of the, um, the Q&A uh, items um, that we have here. Um, there's a question from uh, Nicholas uh, Chia on even if PN can split the Malay votes, what difference does it make to the voting arithmetic? Uh, okay, and then compared to the Johor situation, the Johor situation was unique because voter turnout there was very, very low. In the post-election analysis of Johor, what we noticed was that voters who were, whom we think were automatically registered did not come out in large numbers, perhaps one third. I think the arithmetic is going to be slightly different now because we are projecting at this point in time a higher turnout. And so with a higher turnout, particularly from urban and minority voters, then uh, it helps Pakatan Harapan and that the split in Malay votes doesn't affect Pakatan Harapan as, as acutely as it did in Johor as well as Malacca state elections in the past. And so if Pakatan, uh, sorry, Perikatan National takes more Malay votes away from UMNO uh, or yeah, the more Malay votes they take from UMNO, the better it is slightly for Pakatan Harapan. If BN and PN actually uh, capture between them an almost equal number of Malay percentage of the vote, then that cancels out and it helps Pakatan Harapan. There is a, a kind of sweet spot for PH. I think they have to get at least 18% or about 19%, at which point, you know, they, they probably gain a bigger share, the bigger share of the seats, and then some of their marginal seats uh, come back to them. Uh, that's, I think, one point. There, there's a, yeah, so let me, let me stop there and let Meredith uh, come aboard. Do you have something to add, Meredith? Um, I, I'll, I'll leave it to that on that issue, but then we can turn to some of the other questions because I know we have limited time. Okay, yes. Um, we've got a question from William Case. He's asking, and I quote, he says, are factors stressed in every previous election, but nearly invisible in this one involves electoral manipulations that Barisan once practiced so, it, so effectively. Will these things like district malappropriatement uh, misuse of resources, uh, advantage or case advantage any one uh, party or any one coalition. Yeah. All right. So um, it's a great question in part because we all know that the money machinery media previously also Mahathir were the, the four M's of the Malaysian election landscape. Um, I don't think that we'll see as much of that for this, um, for this election. Um, and there are a couple of reasons. One is that the resources are are divided. So especially if we're looking at both BN and PN, again, they've been both in government together. So all the distribution of GLCs and things like that is between both. But also we're seeing, um, and it's to me still somewhat mysterious. There are some colleagues who are trying to learn more about this. Where some of the funding comes from for some of the newer parties, um, both while they've been in for the offices they've held, for those that have held some share in parliament or as a in state governments, um, but also within their campaign. Um, and picking up on Ben's point, which is a, a completely agree that if there's flooding, that could be one of those you know, deal breaker um, issues that suddenly tilts support for anyone who has not been in government at the time that the election was called. Um, the floods also give a chance for tremendous uh, 
unstable, so let me turn off my video for a moment, tremendous um, generosity and involvement on the ground and so forth. So it can be that um, the floods actually can, can perhaps make it um, parties an opportunity to show their machinery. Um, one other thing that really complicates the scene this time in terms of the role of machinery is that we still have gov state governments in office and therefore able to continue governing as normal in, pos uh, in, in PH and PN states. So the pos governments in three states and the um, uh, Pakatan governments in three states, they are not required to stop governing because there's a federal election. So in that sense, it may actually be that BN is to some extent um, disadvantaged, especially if there's a need for, you know, rapid mobilization around some, something that happens. The larger question about, you know, not just machinery and money, but of delineation, which is a huge concern. I think we can look at this in two ways. There is um, those aspects of delineation that especially help helped BN in the past, whether it be creating more Malay majority districts or whether it be creating more multi-ethnic, multi-communal districts, the mixed seats. Those we've seen in recent elections actually no longer specifically help BN. They help any multiracial coalition if it's the um, effort to create mixed constituencies. And if it's to create heavily Malay districts, those help pass and now Prikata uh, Nacional this time around, just as much as they would help the end. So I don't think that that is as clear an advantage. Where we do still see an issue is this is the issue of urban constituencies, uh, which the Undi 18 shift actually exacerbates, given the prevalence of younger voters who both live and vote in cities. So those are especially non-Malay voters, just because, again, they tend to see um, it, 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 there's only a handful of cities in Malaysia, I think five at last count, that remain majority non-Malay, and yet we don't see as many non-Malays living in rural or even peri-urban settings. So most non-Malays live in cities, it's just most Malays also do, it's just the population difference overall for Malaysia. So the fact that we have these massive constituencies now, that again, Undi 18, the expansion of the electoral rolls has only increased in size, mean that each individual vote matters less for Pakatan in terms of its, its translation to seats. Than, than is the case for those parties that are really contesting in more rural areas, which would be both PN and BN. So it's not a clear advantage for BN, but it is a disadvantage for PH. Right. Um, I've got one last question that I was hoping to ask both of you guys. Um, I think what really caught my eye about Ben's uh, presentation was that the party to look for is PN, right? And uh, and once they hit a critical point uh, in terms of uh, support from Malay voters, then they might actually be serious contenders of being part of a larger coalition. So my question really is, what is the draw of PN versus uh, BN uh, specifically for Malay voters? Do you want to go first, Ben? Uh, okay, I'll take a step at it. Uh, I think number one, it's, um, you know, Barisan National, it's still led principally by personalities that uh, won the party elections in 2018. Uh, many of the candidates have been, ma many prominent personalities have been dropped, but there are still many uh, controversial ones still on the list. And I think, and this is headed by the party president himself. When we speak to younger people in previous surveys, we do note that the perception that young voters have towards Barisan National, younger Malay voters have from Barisan National, isn't that great. So it isn't, it, they have not felt that the party has done enough to change uh, from the past or to change the lineup to reflect a more credible, uh, cleaner uh, you know, list of people. So, that's the problem that Barista National, I think, presently have. And uh, on the other hand, you have uh, Prikata National with Muhyiddin and, um, you know, PAS. Uh, I think this is a view that, you know, predominantly Malay and largely not shared by the uh, other, other Malaysian voters. The view is that, you know, number one, you know, Muhyiddin Yassin paid paid the price for going against Najib over the one MDB scandal. So he's not seen to be a tainted candidate. Instead, he's seen to be a courageous leader who spoke truth to his boss and was punished for it. Number two, when Muhyiddin Yassin and his uh, uh, party and others 
left PH to form Perikatan Nasional in 2020, that was a move that was largely supported by the Malay population. Because we have to remember that in 2018, you know, less than 25% Malay voters supported uh, Pakatan Harapan, uh, voted Pakatan Harapan. So when the shift happened, we noted that um, more than 80% of Malay voters said that the country was now back on the right track. You know, so there is a kind of tacit approval for what he did in March 2020. And this is, I think, a problem why uh, Malay voters find it hard to go to PH. So, you know, right there, uh, Pakatan Harapan presents itself, sorry, Perikatan National presents itself as differentiated from UMNO, slightly cleaner, still committed on the Malay political agenda. Uh, and then, you know, uh, uh, they have passed on board, so Malay credentials are strong and they have uh, Muhyiddin, conservative, more nationalist Malay leader there. So the package, as far as the average Malay, is fairly complete. I think the other point that I want to note here, the last point, is that the uh, and this support is across the board, you know, so it's not just seg segmented into certain uh, parts of the Malay public. We, we can see that in the state election in Malacca and Johor, uh, you know, even military personnel voted for PN as well. So they captured, you know, 35 to 45 percent of the uh, armed services personnel in the state election. So this is something unprecedented. And so if this trend persists into this election, they could do well. And I just want to link it to Bill Case's question about gerrymandering and malapportionment. Uh, so what happens now is that Prikata National you know, hardly has any support amongst the minorities. So Prikata National can only you know, go at the Malay constituencies that are 70% Malay majority or higher. Uh, but there are many constituencies here. So anything that 70% and below, Pakatan Harapan probably will still keep, except for a few cases. Uh, in the case of Kairi or Tengku Zafrul, where these are celebrity politicians, they might be able to swing a bigger share of the votes and scrape through. But in other places, the base vote for PH is fairly strong. So the gerrymandering and malapportionment you know, will uh, help Perikatan National uh, once they reach 50% or more of the Malay votes in a three-way or four-way contest like what we have now. Okay, so I will um, address Nawal's question and then also um, a little bit of, of Johan's question that I see online, which <laughs> if you don't mind, just because uh, I know time is short. So in terms of um, the BN versus the PN, that's actually one of the things I've been trying to get a better handle on. And it's interesting to, to see the extent to which there isn't really a clear articulation of what the difference is beyond the fact, as Ben mentioned, of stressing that that the, the BN, specifically UMNO, has more of has the court cluster that they have these you know corrupt leaders. We've heard um, a clear articulation of a BN sort of talking point of you know against Pakatan as oh well the DAP has its own court cluster you know in the form of basically Lim Guan Eng, um, as well and therefore you know everybody's corrupt so we uh, just deal with it. Um, but the the question of differentiation of the two parties. It's really not that clear. And there's there was also I noticed a question in there of, about, you know, the sort of personality and and if that helps the, you know, for those who had hopped between some of these parties um, to differentiate. Yes. So part of it is really not stressing how they differentiate between for Malay voters or for any other voters, but it's really Malay voters in this case, as Ben has noted. It's not it's less about how they differentiate between BN and PN. Then rather, especially since they've been in the government together, then rather really keeping the focus on the candidate themselves. And so we're seeing that even for fairly strong leaders within PN parties. Um, and so that's, that's I think, a difference from before of less reliance, perhaps because of, you know, as a PN in particular has been highly reliant on survey data and trying to pull, in, pull the ground, figure out what's going on. You know, all parties do that, but it's a new coalition, so they have less basis on which to, you know, sort of extrapolate from past experience. Um, it, the, the polling data has shown lesser party loyalty, especially among the approximately third of voters who are, you know, considered youth voters. Since I do think that that's one of the reasons why we're seeing less effort to um, 
again, stop the videos and a little unstable to reify the parties to make clear how they're really different. Um, this the other issue though here has to do with the DAP and pass. So Johan asks in the chat, I'm sorry to preempt you here, Amnal, about whether DAP voters would accept pass. I think it's really more a question of the reverse. The extent of demonization of the DAP is to the extent that we've seen uh, you know, Chirama speeches by DAP simply shouting out, you know, basically they say we're communists, they say we're anti-Islam, we're not. But just recognizing that that's the charge and embracing it directly. Um, for the DAP, so far, it seems that the, the line is that they will go along with what their party leaders uh, determine and that it will be up to the party leaders. And in the past, the DAP has indeed follow, followed along with leaders' decisions in terms of, for instance, allying with Versace, with, with Mahathir, which was in many ways just as surprising. Um, the DAP has fewer options in terms of alliance partners um, just because they are so heavily demonized within uh, the Malaysian party landscape than PAS does. So I would I would really see that to be more the, the issue of whether PAS voters would accept, would accept that um, and the extent to which you know voters will endlessly transfer their support to the coalition that their leaders decide to join or if at some point we'll see some weakening of the legendary PAS loyalty and even DAP loyalty that we've seen in recent elections. Uh Thank you very much um, to both speakers. I'm going to pass it back to Ariel to bring the session to a close. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm sorry we couldn't get through all the questions. Um, before I close, may I know whether it's uh, Ben or Meredith would like to um, uh, give any last words before I, I conclude? Yeah, just one minute, Ariel. So I think, you know, th this is uh, an interesting election because you know, for the first time, we see that DN's dominant among Malay voters are uh, really challenged. Uh, and I think for us uh, here at Bodeka, you know, we, we are looking at a couple of things uh, moving moving forward. Number one, you know, will there, because there are also three state elections happening at the same time, will the shift that's happening at the federal level also take place at the state, uh, particularly in places like uh, Perlis, because, you know, Shahidan Kasim has joined PN, and then within his own parliamentary constituency, there's five state constituencies. So, you know, for the state of Perlis, which is about the size of a basketball court, uh, that could mean a significant shift in the government. And then, um, you know, in Pahang as well, we have a theory running here that that little bit of a highway that connects from the um, from Temerlo to Gua Musang and from Temerlo to Kuantan, that stretch of highway has already uh, inroads made by PAS in 2018 whether or not that's going to further expand. Uh, and then num and, and at the same, in the same vein, whether there's any hope for Barisan National in the states of Kedah, Trunganu, and Kelantan moving forward. The second thing that we are detecting is that there might be differences in terms of voters, particularly Malay voters, making their choice in those states where uh, the state elections have not been held. So like Selangor, Penang, Negeri Sembilan, and uh, Kedah Kelantan, Terengganu. Uh, because we think that here, you know, Pakatan Harapan may, may or may not uh, benefit from how they have performed in the state. That there might be a situation where uh, voters might choose PH at, for a state election, but may not choose PH for the federal election. That, that might be a case as well we are detecting some kind of split voting uh, happening, although there's only one vote, but there's a kind of difference in the way the voters are processing things. And then finally, just to touch a little bit on what uh, Johan uh, says, I think, you know, DAP probably will not object working with Barisan National, provided there's a way of addressing the Zahid, uh, Zahid and some of the, the court cluster leaders. But with respect of PAS, um, I think the feeling is mutual, you know, but, uh, but I think the one point that I want to say is this, you know, ever since past joint federal government in 2020, they have not raised the issue of hudud at all. Uh, and as a result, the temperature on the issue of Sharia and hudud that has reduced significantly compared to before. Uh, and that the use of Islam as a topic to mobilize voters have have declined somewhat. So having passed in government could at some level moderate their rhetoric, you know, but it, of course it doesn't change the fact that the parties will continue to try and expand their influence on the, on the public. 
Meredith? I'm happy to leave that last excellent last word to Ben. Thank you, thank you. So um, we hope that um, you have enjoyed yourselves and found this useful. I would like to thank our speakers and audience for giving us your time. I would also like to thank our events team for their wonderful support. Have a good day, everyone.